Oh, it's just so good to be back to my alma mater. And, and it's especially good to be here on the occasion of honoring my teacher and somebody who's been a colleague and a teacher to so many people here present, uh, Billy Abraham. My education at Perkins has been deeply formative. My thinking and acting in the church and the academy has been profoundly shaped by what I received at Perkins, particularly as a result of Billy's mentorship. He was a man of extraordinary breadth and depth of interests. He was an Oxford-trained philosopher and a first-rate systematic theologian. His bestseller, The Logic of Evangelism, still has enduring value, still, uh, Erdman still continues uh, selling uh, the copies of this book, uh, despite the fact that it's been published more than 30 years ago. And he was also a missionary to places as far as Kazakhstan, Nepal, Costa Rica, and Romania that was mentioned today to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth. So this is uh, some missionary teaching that we did in Costa Rica in 2010. He was a passionate and dedicated Sanji school teacher. For an extra credit, could master's students identify with Billy is in that picture? <laughs> yes, he's right there. You, yeah, yes, yes, you're, you, you're right. He's right there in the corner. And uh, so, so I think this is, as you can see, this is a trip to his own dear uh, Northern Ireland. Even when he retired from full-time ministry in the church, at his heart, he remained a pastor. And above all else, he remained a thinker and an educator, shaping over a generation of pastors studied at Perkins. So his legacy is going to be that generation of pastors that he formed here. As a mentor, he gave his students exceptional freedom. One could compare him to what Gregory the Wonder Worker said about origin. And I quote from Gregory, we were permitted with all freedom to go around the whole circle of knowledge and investigate it and satisfy ourselves with all kinds of doctrines and enjoy the sweets of the intellect. Now, Gregory subsequently tells us that as they were enjoying the sweets of the intellects, the Alexandrian master led them back to the writings of the prophets. And that could be also true about Billy because he devoted much of his scholarly career to the intellectual defense of the integrity of divine revelation. In my today's lecture, I will have the opportunity to touch upon Billy's magnum opus, Canon and Criterion in Christian Theology, From the Fathers to Feminism, which was published with Oxford when I was his research assistant in 1998. And I remember that book emerging chapter by chapter every week. I mean, he would churn out literally a chapter a week of this book um, and then copy editing it, etc. So I will argue, yes, this is a humbling experience, I'm sure, for graduate students. No worries, doctoral students. You're not supposed to write a chapter of your dissertation one chapter a week. That's not the pace we expect from you. Maybe a chapter a month. Uh. <laughs> Uh, Billy often called me a slave driver because I really like to keep things on schedule. Uh, but I think I learned this from Methodists because you really like things on time. <laughs> so I will, argue, I will argue that in this book, the development of doctrine is an important issue behind the issues. Now, the idea of doctrinal development is often associated with John Henry Newman and his classic work, an essay on the development of Christian doctrine, published in 1845. Around this time, Newman moved away from the Anglican Church and was received into the Roman Catholic Church. Newman's essay on doctrinal development offered an intellectual justification for his own theological evolution, and needs to be read in that light. The work gave an account of the positive development of doctrine in response to critics who interpreted doctrinal change as a corruption or departure from the original ideal. Since so much of the criticism depends on how the original ideal is understood, I suggest that we treat the narratives of corruption under the umbrella term originalism. So the term originalism is mine, not Newman's. 
The originalist narratives share a common historiographic assumption that subsequent developments and the present situation represent a departure from the original ideal. Together, these narratives can be classified as the narratives of decline. So I'm giving you just a few examples of what those narratives typically look like. The most common narrative of decline, epitomized in Luther's Sola Scriptura, was to understand particular doctrine or practice as a departure from scripture. Other narratives of decline interpreted doctrinal corruption as a bad influence of Greek philosophy. Still other narratives of decline went even further. So for example, for, pieties, uh, for, pi uh, for, for the pietists, such as Jakob Spener, the decline was marked by the moral degradation of the church. Since in the aftermath of the Reformation, doctrinal debates generated much social unrest and even wars across Europe, any assertion of doctrinal orthodoxy could lead to violence. And so still others argued that the decline also came when the Emperor Constantine co-opted the church for political purposes as a social glue promising to bind the Roman Empire. Now, it's not my intention here to explore these narratives in any depth. I simply want to point out that there are different forms of the originalist story, which attribute decline to different causes. Now, let me pose to make one methodological observation. When biblical scholars, historical theologians, and systematicians consider a particular doctrine historically, they most frequently make narrative, uh, normative assumptions about the subject matter, explicitly or implicitly. We're increasingly skeptical about the possibility of judgment, neutral descriptions of historical transformations of any doctrine. If such a theological judgment is on balance positive, historical theologians might join Newman in theorizing about a positive development of doctrine. By positive development of doctrine, I understand a change of, doctrine, of doctrine's form that is continuous with that doctrine's content. This preservation of continuity is a necessary element of any positive development. And so in his essay on the development, Newman discusses eight kinds of development in ideas and maintains that the development of theological ideas must follow at least five of them. Uh, and those five are political, logical, historical, ethical, and metaphysical. Now, we do not have to follow the particulars of Newman's paradigms of such a development, but we could agree with Newman that a development that preserves doctrine's continuity is, is faithful or authentic or at least theologically justifiable. So continuity means uh, that the development is positive. Alternatively, if a given doctrine or practice is problematic, then we would be inclined to adopt a narrative of decline. Again, what specific narrative of decline we adopt is up to us. My point is that it would be some form of such narrative. And so my conclusion that is that in practice, most historians and systematicians, when they reflect on the matter, hold a mixture of positive development views and decline narrative views depending on the doctrine and the period that is under consideration. So let me highlight one significant example of such a mixed narrative of positive development and decline. In Canon and Criterion, Billy Abraham offers what at first seems like a narrative of decline. His main thesis is that in the second millennium, Christian theology in the West was taken hostage by epistemologies that had the overall effect of undermining theology's claim to knowledge. This is in the broadest possible terms. The shift happened by turning canon, think for example of the list of the books of scripture, which originally functioned as means of grace leading those who believe in Jesus to salvation, by turning that means of grace into an epistemological norm. And so having surveyed general theories of knowledge from Cartesian skepticism to Lockean empiricism to Kantian rationalism and a number of others, Abraham finds that these epistemological proposals were detrimental to the status of special divine revelation as central norm of Christian theology. That's the overall negative argument of that book. Now, I do not wish into, to enter into a detailed discussion of Abraham's thesis, although we could certainly take this up in the Q&A. Let me simply register that what we have at this, in this important book at first sight is a large-scale narrative of the doctrine's decline due to the misunderstanding of the function 
of the canon and misapplication of the function of the canon. However, within the same work, within the same canon and criterion, we also have a proposal for the retrieval of what Abraham calls the church's canonical heritage. Now, this heritage consists of persons, texts, and practices that were canonized by the church at large. So the examples of canonized persons include saints and doctors of the church. The examples of texts would include the scriptures and the creeds, such as the Nicene Creed and the Chalcedonian definition. And the examples of practices would include threefold orders of ministry of bishop, priest, and deacon, ancient liturgies, and also religious arts, such as icons. Now, Abraham's concept of the canonical heritage was subsequently developed in a Perkins Group research project, and I want to mention it and to some extent advertise it here, uh, that was subsequently called canonical theism, uh, which was a sequel to canon and criterion. While Abraham doesn't propose any particular theory of doctrinal development, he interpreted the major doctrinal decisions of the ecumenical councils as instances of authentic and positive change. Hence, within the same book, Canon and Criterion, we have both an account of positive development of the teaching of the undivided church during the first millennium, and then the narrative of theology's decline after the Great Schism. That's in the broadest outline what that his historical narrative is. So here I wish to return to my observation that when we consider the development of Christian doctrine in its historical permutations, we're likely to embrace a mixed narrative of positive development and decline. And you might be asking, what types of views do I hold, uh, I meaning us in the audience, on any particular case, any particular instance of change? Now, in some cases, one might have recourse to different paradigms of both, but the general point remains valid. It will be some mixture of those two narratives. Now, of course, one might remain skeptical about any narrative at all, it's perfectly fine, but I myself do not think that such suspension of theological judgment is particularly constructive. One still would need to commit. So before I get to my central thesis about this matter of the doctrines that do and some that do not develop, let me also point out or mention, um, in fact, a case of the outright rejection of doctrinal development. And so, uh, so there are theologians today who would still reject that effectively doctrines develop at all. Now, the worry at the heart of the objection is epistemological. So it's, it's about how we know things. That, that, that big word epistemology means a theory of knowledge. The, this objection is favored by an influential orthodox patristic scholar, Andrew Louth. According to Louth, the claim that doctrine develops entails that we, 21st century Christians, know more about God than did the prophets and the apostles. And so for Louth, this view finds favor among other scholars. Uh, it is epistemologically arrogant to believe that we know more. And to make this a bit more personal, it would be presumptuous to claim that I, Paul, know about God more than my patron saint, the apostle Paul. It's far more likely that I know a lot less. In fact, I'm sure of that, okay? <laughs> Hence, any assumption of the positive development of doctrine is epistemologically presumptuous and spiritually damaging. That is Louth's objection, that is Louth's position. I, I sort of want you to feel the weight of it, okay? Uh, before we get to its inevitable refutation. So, I think that it's relatively easy to show that this objection is based on the equivocation on the main term, namely what counts for knowledge. And the objection could be may, uh, met by distinguishing between personal knowledge and conceptual knowledge, or to use Bertrand Russell's terms, knowledge by acquaintance and knowledge by description. Personal knowledge is based on personal acquaintance. So to say, for example, that I know Billy Abraham personally is to say that we spend quality time together, is to say that some of his words and actions were rev uniquely revelatory of his character. To say that I know lots of facts about Billy Abraham could be unpacked as, I know that he was a talented teacher and a brilliant mind, I know that he was a caring husband and a dedicated father, and so on. So knowledge by acquaintance could be and often provides grounds for knowledge by description, 
However, knowledge by acquaintance is neither necessary nor sufficient for knowledge by description. So one doesn't have to rely on experience exclusively in order to obtain factual knowledge. It is often effectively more productive to rely on testimony. In other words, what others tell me about Billy, what scholars tell me about Billy, friends, etc., in order to obtain factual knowledge. And so uh, collective memory and testimony are two important sources for that. So let me now apply this distinction to the case in point, and that is to the issue, to uh, the objection to the development of doctrine. Now, the Apostle Paul and his colleagues had profound personal knowledge of God in Christ. This can absolutely, that, that, that fact is certain. God disclosed himself uniquely to them, and they knew God by acquaintance, assuming that it's possible for God to be known in this way. And I believe that it is. The personal knowledge of Jesus Christ and God that they had was uniquely their own. Such personal knowledge or personal understanding may or may not be measured by degrees. There's no obvious measure by which one would compare, let's say, the Apostle Peter's personal knowledge of Christ with that of the Apostle Paul's. In fact, even the question might strike you as somewhat misguided. The content of the personal knowledge of God consists in religious experience, some of which is inexpressible and incommunicable. And so here is St. Paul's epiphatic moment. This is 2 Corinthians 12 to 4. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told that no mortal is permitted to repeat. End of quotation. Now, as many commentators believe, the Apostle Paul is here referring to himself in the third person, and the experience of God that he had on this occasion was largely, as you can see, ineffable and incommunicable. It's something that one cannot repeat. So the apophatic dimension of personal knowledge cannot be surpassed by any future generations of Christian leaders, no matter how closely they claim to be acquainted with God. However, the post-apostolic generations of Christian leaders have contributed to the growth of the conceptual knowledge of God, that is to say, the knowledge by description. Now, if they have not, then the Trinitarian and Christological controversy were mostly exercises in futility. Now, in this sense, not in the experiential sense, an average theology student today, so congratulations, theology students, <laughs> knows about God, in fact, more than the Apostle Paul. For example, it's generally accepted that the Pauline letters in the New Testament as a whole do not offer a well-developed doctrine of the Trinity. That would not be a surprise to any Perkins grad. Hence, an average theology student would be able to conceptualize God as the Trinity in a manner that would have, been would have not been immediately obvious to most Christian leaders living in the apostolic age. Hence, we can adopt a nuanced understanding of the development of doctrine, specifying that the conceptual knowledge of God can, in fact, grow, while personal knowledge of God cannot, thereby avoiding the pitfalls of epistemological arrogance. We're not measuring experience. We are, however, measuring the clarity and the conceptual sophistication with which a particular doctrinal insight is expressed. Now let me turn to my central thesis. Some Christian doctrines have developed in a clearly identifiable historical manner. Such, for example, is the case with the doctrine of the Incarnation, as I will demonstrate in a moment. However, the development of some other doctrines was more ad hoc and often, in fact, defies any clear-cut paradigm. So again, as I will show in a moment, this is the situation with the doctrine of deification. In the absence of a clearly defined pattern of development, it's reasonable to doubt whether an ad hoc changes could be credibly described as development. So let me proceed to my concrete examples of the incarnation and deification to illustrate my point. So let me try, uh, start with something that would be more um, known to this learned audience, and that is with the doctrine of the incarnation. When we look at the early Christian theology from the apostolic period on, we see a consistent preoccupation of the church leaders with Christology. In the Synoptic Gospels, Jesus poses to his disciples the following central question, 
And that is the question, who do you, my disciples, think that I am? Say that I am. And the confessional statements that address this question from Jesus is Lord to rules of faith to later creeds are at the heart, essentially, all answers to this question. Who do you say that I am? This question is first addressed within the religious, cultural, and political matrix of early Judaism. And as the church began to part its ways with the synagogue, this question was then posed and addressed in the broader cultural context of the Hellenistic world and the Roman Empire. In that new context, the question was broken down into two main issues. What is Jesus' relationship to God, whom he called his father, and what is his relationship to us, human beings? So the answer that was collectively discerned by the church leadership was at once paradoxical and comprehensive. Jesus is both one with the Father and with us human beings. Now, it would take centuries before this answer will acquire the clarity and the precision of the Chalcedonian definition. Uh, a story of how the church arrived at the Chalcedonian definition takes central stage in the textbooks of early Christian theology, and it's the subject of countless specialized studies. It's a story that could be told in many ways, which I won't be rehearsing here, you'd be relieved, because we still want to get to the Q&A. The decisions of the first three ecumenical councils, Nicaea 325, Constantinople 381, and Ephesus 431, provided important signposts in this winding road without exhausting its meaning. In the broadest possible strokes, Nicaea 325 focused on the articulation of son's divinity, and that doesn't come as a surprise, uh, and his relationship with the father. Constantinople 381 focused on articulating the son's uh, humanity, declaring him to be fully human. The obvious question that then subsequently needed to be resolved is how you put the two together. And the Council of Ephesus, and then subsequently Chalcedon, struggled precisely with this question. To be clear, the historical particulars of this story were not as tidy as my summary may imply. Instead, we must acknowledge some unexpected twists and turns. For example, the original creed of the Council of Nicaea would be fiercely debated for two generations, with several later councils gathered in order to revise and even to overturn or reject was what, be, what was being offered and offering alternative creeds. So there was a lot of creed making in the middle of the fourth century. Long term, however, these revisionist attempts have, provided, uh, have proved unsuccessful. And by the end of the fourth century, the authoritative character of the Nicene faith has been firmly established, broadly speaking. So again, let me emphasize that the historical narrative of the church's grappling with the mystery of the incarnation has been contentious rather than peaceful. So this isn't, it's not a, it's, uh, development is always a patchy story. Doctrinal development should not be imagined as a straight line, rather it's a winding road. For example, the adoption of the faith of Nicaea by the Council of Constantinople had the effect of rendering the creedal formulas of several earlier 4th century councils simply obsolete. So in the life of the church, reception is not synonymous with collective repressed and remembering alone. On the contrary, reception also entails a measure of collective forgetting or even rejection of the previous decisions. So we, we tend to think of reception as something woolly and wonderful into what you can fit everything, and clearly that's not quite the case. Reception could also simply be by this, hmm, maybe. Maybe not. Actually, the scholars, let me just make this particular comment, the scholars should in fact assume that the church at large would be, uh, generally speaking, receiving our proposals in this fashion and would only be endorsing some. So when we believe somehow that the church should be taking everything on board, we're mistaken. And of course, uh, the church doesn't, generally speaking, doesn't profit from that. So it, it has to be a wonderful, contentious, and, and complex relationship between the academy of the church. It can never be something straightforward. In contemporary historical theology, the term reception is generally favored over the term development because reception is rightly regarded as less loaded with normative assumptions about continuity than does the term development. Development refers to an account of doctrinal change that entails continuity. And to put this differently, development indicates also a particular pattern of change. 
whether than, whereas reception doesn't really have that element. So some councils have, in fact, explicitly and successfully overturned the decisions of the previous councils. So for example, uh, the church leaders gathered at the Council of Chalcedon in 451, rejected the decisions of the Robbers Council in 449. Likewise, those gathered at the Second Council of Nicaea in 787 overturned the decision of the Council of 754 by refuting its iconoclastic theology and by offering a rationale for the veneration of religious images. And again, that's also had an interesting and patchy story in the West. So the conciliar process was fraught with controversy, political intrigue, and ecclesiastical shenanigans. Again, one shouldn't... Shenanigans, by the way, was Billy's favorite word. <laughs> It's not surprising that ecclesiastical decisions are often as conflict-ridden as political decisions. And the reason for that is because in any, uh, when you're trying to decide any issue that matters, they're going to be, there's going to be contention. That, that's to be expected. It's very strange how in the academy we've grown too touchy about these things. Well, look at the world of politics, right? So... <laughs> Uh, nevertheless, when we follow the story of the Ecumen, I'm an Eastern European, I can put up with a lot of, uh, let's say, conflict. Yeah. Uh, I, also, I, also, I also inherited, I think, I, 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 I inherited Billy's uh, propensity to uh, start organizations. And so I, I started something, Rebuild Ukraine, at the very beginning of the war. And really, I mostly, really presently think in terms of tourniquets and bandages and things that one, medical supplies that one could supply to Ukraine to save lives, then I think in terms of books. But I still do love the life of the mind. Nevertheless, when we follow the story of the ecumenical councils, it's remarkable just how deliberately and methodically the later ecumenical councils built upon the achievements of the previous ecumenical councils. So consider just for, uh, with me one example, and that is the decree summarizing the, do the decrinal achievement of the seventh ecumenical council that I've already mentioned, and that's Nicaea 787. First, that decree acknowledges that the church was in crisis due to the iconoclastic uh, uh, policies of the previous emperors. The recognition of a major decrinal ecclesiological crisis is a common trope in the conciliar acts. Second, the bishops who wrote the decree pledged to follow the path of truth, signaling continuity with the preceding tradition. Furthermore, they pledged not to diminish or alter anything, but rather preserve unchanged all things that pertain to the Catholic Church. And that's a really good kind of pre-modern rhetoric. Because usually what comes after those words is precisely something that they're going to now introduce as relatively new. So this rather sweeping generalization about the unchangeability of tradition is a common trope. Even as the bishops were putting forth a new conciliar decree so that, in their own words, the traditions of the Catholic Church would, not be rendered, would now be rendered stable, they at the same time emphasize the unchangeability of doctrine. So again, that's a common thing. Introducing change and yet uh, insisting on continuity. In the minds of the council participants, the doctrine remained unchanged. In the actual practice, significant clarifications and changes had been introduced into the Christian understanding of religious images and the relevant practices. In other words, previously to the, uh, that council, we had only informal uh, theology, if you will, of religious art and iconography, and the council itself then sanctions a very particular way of looking at them. Third, the authors of the decree used a notable expression following the six councils. The expression appears several times in the Acts of Nicaea 787 and was already in use a generation ago. Nicaea 787 viewed itself as a sequel to the previous six ecumenical councils, so it operates already with that notion. The authors of the decree grounded their theology in the Christological formulations of the first six ecumenical councils. Having cited the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed in full, the decree proceeded to explain the contributions of Ephesus to the veneration of Mary, to the unity of Christ's person, and then acknowledged the Chalcedonian definition as the main reference point for the proclamation of the two natures of Christ. Then it noted the condemnations of the fifth council and also mentioned that the sixth council had established the doctrine of the two wills in Christ. So having acknowledged these landmark Christological developments, the decree stated that the production of religious images, especially those of Christ, testified to the reality of the divine incarnation. So that was the logic. 
The decree proceeded to offer other reasons justifying the veneration of images, as well as made an important distinction between absolute worship that belongs to God alone, otherwise we are indeed idolatrous if we attribute that to images, and then respect a veneration that pertains to images. So the details are not important here, but what is significant, however, is the decree explicitly and deliberately built upon the main doctrinal achievements of the preceding six councils. We have here a paradigmatic case of the development of doctrine, even if the bishops who signed the decree would have been reluctant to use the word development. They were intent on insisting on the idea that nothing has changed at all. And so according to the de decree, the doctrine of the incarnation developed in several major stages marked by the decisions of the preceding six councils. To insist that the doctrine of the incarnation was the subject to development is really to belabor the obvious, especially in this learned company. Now, other doctrines have not been equally fortunate, however. Unlike the doctrine of how God assumes human nature and becomes one of us, its corollary of how humans come to participate in the life of God has not been the subject of comparably rigorous conciliar scrutiny and traceable development. So I've just finished editing the Oxford Handbook of Deification with Andrew Hofer and Matthew Levering. And the, ha the handbook tells a story and... Um, 32 of its chapters effectively are dedicated to the history of the doctrine of deification, but it is not a story of a straightforward development. Such early Christian theologians as Irenaeus of Lyon, Clement of Alexandria, and Origen developed different aspects of the doctrine, especially the so-called exchange formula. And the exchange formula, one version of it is, God became human so that humans could become divine. Now, if that's not scandalous and not problematic, I don't know what is. So you can see the statement, so that humans could become divine, really needs a lot of unpacking and explaining <laughs> and caution and you know, et cetera. So, and what is really extraordinary about this story is that none of that caution is actually given. They just drop this. They assume that's true. They also assume that everybody would understand you're not becoming the fourth person of the Trinity here, but you are, but you are participating in the life of God by grace, okay? Uh, but again, no controversy. No controversy around this question. In the fifth century, you would expect there would be a controversy because it's a logical thing to do. And Nestorius says uh, Jesus' human and divine nature should be relatively sharply distinguished, and Cyril of Alexandria wants in the interests uh, of precisely expressing the intuition of deification to unite them as closely as possible. Well, you would expect them to argue over deification because deification then becomes really, really at the core of it is precisely how is it that we are united with God. Nobody touches the subject. And when it's touched, it's in the 6th century, it's a very obscure controversy within Nestorianism itself. That really only the scholars of the Assyrian Church of the East would even, even think about and, and write about. So it's, a, it's, it's really quite extraordinary that effectively uh, theosis does not really get much attention. Um, the th word theosis itself is introduced by Gregory Nazianzus, and then we have to wait until the early 6th century before the first definition is given, and that is by the figure of Pseudo-Dionysius. And it's only in Maximus the Confessor that we have theosis functioning as the framework concept, and therefore it's only in Maximus, that's a 7th century theologian, in, who, uh, in whose work theosis uh, then becomes really theoretic, uh, theoretically very, very highly developed. So, shockingly, we have to wait until the 14th century when Gregory Palamas offers the first monographic treatment of deification in his treatise on divine and deifying energies. So, again, you can think about it this way. Lots of books on the incarnation, monographs and whatnot, if you will, during this period. Uh, but theosis itself uh, gets honorary mention, de is developed certainly by Maximus, but again, nobody zeroes in on the subject. Palamas specified that while it was possible to participate in the divine activities or energies, it was impossible for creatures to participate in the divine essence. That's a crucial distinction that avoids precisely the problem that I articulated, and that is that this language to becoming divine should not amount to the language of becoming 
God ontologically or by essence. So that was a, a critical distinction that is introduced. But notice, the clarity about this distinction is only acquired in the Byzantine East in the 14th century. Okay? And there are very important Western debates uh, into which I will not enter um, uh, today uh, that parallel that development. But again, the clarity itself is not there actually in, in the West. So is it possible to say then that the doctrine of deification does not develop at all? Now, that would be theologically naive and historically inaccurate. So let me be clear as to what I'm actually claiming and not claiming. I titled my presentations The Doctrines That Develop and Do Not Develop because I wanted you to smile. <laughs> and I also, I simply wanted to tease you into thinking about a question, really, primarily. So I don't think it would be possible. So however, the doctrine of deification, its development, if we can speak of it at all, was really ad hoc. In fact, many Christian authors, for many Christian authors, deification hardly functioned as a theoretically developed concept at all. The exceptions that I mentioned earlier only prove the rule. And in the West, the theological credentials of deification were challenged as late as the 19th century work of Albert Ritchell and Adolf von Harnock. We really have to wait for them to irritate enough people into then looking at deification seriously. And uh, Harnock was, was, was especially interesting in this regard. It's their critique that was a major factor in spurring the early 20th century resurgence of interest in the doctrine of deification. As a result, in contemporary theolo uh, uh, theology, deification is no longer treated as a charming Eastern Christian oddity. Rather, the soteriological vision articulated in terms of deification and participation in the life of God, a very Wesleyan, by the way, theme, is gradually becoming an ecumenical desideratum. So how do you move out of exclusively juridical categories into the categories that are more holistic and are more therapeutic? Well, one way of doing it is through the notion of participation in God and deification. And so the chapters of our handbook that focus on systematic theologians precisely articulate the doctrine's ecumenical potential. So to conclude then, in this talk I defended two claims. First, when we look at the historical fortunes of any Christian doctrine, we operate within the framework of two major paradigms, and that is the narrative of positive development and the narratives of decline. The narrative of decline requires an account of how things were originally and what went wrong, and that is something I called originalism. I suggest that it may be useful to analyze your own views on historical developments of doctrine in terms of the mixture of those two narratives. Second, I also asked whether there might be doctrines that hardly develop at all. I confess that my intention was, again, to provoke you into thinking about such doctrines. I looked at the historical vicissitudes of two doctrines, incarnation and deification, and suggested that for the doctrine of deification, we have a clear historical record of complex and deliberate development, precisely in the sense of gradual unfolding and conceptual clarification of the main issues at stake namely how to think of Jesus as both divine and human. The, ex the extent acts of the ecumenical councils testify to the process of collecting de collective discernment in which the leaders of the later councils refer to and consciously build upon uh, those confessions and doctrinal developments. The result is a clear and identifiable pattern of development. The gradual unfolding of the church's teaching, where things that were left implicit and unclear in one century are then tested and debated in the following centuries, re resulting in greater conceptual precision and clarification. In its historical details, the process was complex and the debates at times acrimonious, but none of this detracts us from the fact that incarnation presents an important paradigm for developing a doctrine in a conciliar manner. This is why I'm a fan of synodality and conciliarity. It's for that reason. I, I don't think it's a panacea from all problems, certainly not, but I think it's an important vehicle for collective discernment. However, when we turn to the doctrine of deification, which is an important corollary of the doctrine of the incarnation, we do not find an equally clear-cut paradigm of doctrinal development. While it would be inaccurate to claim that the doctrine of deification did not undergo any change at all, so I'm not saying that, okay? Uh, it could be said that it went through different historical expressions without any discernible pattern of development. And so I submit to you that many Christian doctrines are more like 
the doctrine of deification than they are like the incarnation when we look at their historical transformations closely. It's for this reason that it would be misleading to speak of the development of all Christian doctrines. Rather, there are some doctrines that develop and others that don't, at least not in a manner that reveals a clear pattern. All future discussions of doctrinal development should take note of this matter. Historical theologians and all students of the history of Christianity may then be free to pursue their investigation where the evidence leads them, rather than presume to find a clear-cut paradigm for the development of each doctrine. And this is why I think Newman's treatise ended up being rather forced. Wonderful, but forced. The outcome might not be as neat as some apologists would like us to, uh, them to be. However, such a result would simply be more faithful to history. The trinal development is not a Procrustean bed. Therefore, we should not force into it the doctrines that, while significant, hardly develop at all. Thank you very much. Thank you.